the things we value at Emmanuel Baptist Church are being for the gospel, for the city, and for the world. want to create a kingdom advancing gospel culture. Good morning, Emmanuel. Let's stand together and sing as we begin our worship service this morning.
glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. Lord
Bible tells us that therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we praise him, we worship him, we give him all the glory and honor. Would you sing that chorus with us? I think you know it by now. Sing it with us, all the praise. take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. How are y'all doing by the way? Everybody doing okay? Really excited uh, to get into God's Word with three others of you. So we're uh, we're excited about that uh, this morning. So um, I always really respect guys who uh, are good athletes, probably like we all do, especially runners. It just impresses me, those elite athletes. And so I was talking to a guy uh, the other day and figured out, one of the members of our church, that he was a runner, that he was a marathoner. But that just wasn't the significant thing. He was also fast. Uh, I could do a marathon. It'll involve a walker, multiple oxygen tanks, things like this. But he's actually fast. In fact, was a pacer at the Little Rock Marathon for a certain uh, pace. And so he has children about my age. And so I said to his daughter, I'm thinking he's about nine years old or something. I heard your dad run marathons. And she said, I run marathons. So I started to laugh. She wasn't laughing, just total seriousness. I run marathons. And I kind of laughed and said, you do, you run marathons. Again, totally convinced I run marathons. I thought, you're the sweetest little liar. You're just not run marathons. What are you talking about? So what I found out later talking to her mom, here's the story. So when he completes a marathon, this 26.2 miles, when he's right toward the end, the family joins in. Isn't that great? And so they all join in together. They're on the last little leg together. And then they all celebrate as if they'd all won. And so I thought, this is a great, this is a great idea. Because if you're going to do something that challenging, you're going to need, especially toward the end, some strong encouragement, right? So a strong challenge demands strong encouragement. And that's Hebrews 6. In Hebrews 6, maybe the strongest in the Bible, certainly the strongest in Hebrews, which is saying something. There's this massive warning. And the warning is, if you kind of wade in these waters of immaturity, you may not get out. If you're just so lethargic, you may find yourself in a position where your heart is never turned back to God again. The scary warning. But what we often don't consider is that the book of Hebrews ends, or the chapter 6 ends, it ends with an equally strong encouragement. Now this morning, uh, the book of Hebrews, this passage, like all the passages in Hebrews, is weighty. Uh, Hebrews, almost every turn, has something of gravity and of importance about it. But... For many of you this morning, this is not a theological or abstract thing. You are in desperate need of some strong encouragement. And I want to show you something as we get into the text this morning that just thinking about this week that I think is so incredibly remarkable. The way the text is going to move is it's going to give us a general encouragement, verses 13 through 15, a specific encouragement, Verses 16, 17, 18, and then 19, 20 are going to give us something exact, like laser-focused, important, significant encouragement for where we are. But as you look at at the massive plan of God throughout the ages, what we might call the history of salvation that God initiated and will one day complete in the person of Jesus Christ. As you look at that huge plan throughout Scripture, there are multiple times that God condescends, he, He comes down, in a gracious way to engage our doubt. Is that a remarkable thought? I mean, very specific instances. He comes down to specific key people in human history and he just assuages their doubt. He just gives them confidence about their future. 
And it's so remarkable to me that if God would come down to humanity and at specific points try to manage our weakness, manage our mental frailty, manage our intestinal fortitude, wouldn't it stand to reason that he still wants to do that? And for some of us, he wants to do it right now, this morning. He wants to meet you and shore up your doubt about him. That's the history of how he operates. So here's where divinity touches humanity. Let's look first of all at this general encouragement. So we're in Hebrews chapter 6, the strong warning, verses 1 through 8. He begins to say in verse 9, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. And now he begins to unpack what these better things are that he's confident about. Here's his general encouragement, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So his general encouragement is this. God made a promise, an oath to Abraham. Now, that may seem like something that's unrelated to where you live and I live, but it's actually critically important. That's a specific reference to something that happened in history. And so let's look at it together. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to Genesis chapter 22. Look at Genesis chapter 22. And when you find it, we're going to look at verse 15 in just a minute, Genesis chapter 22. When you find it, just wait there and let's set this up of what's going on. God, in the context of the Bible, as you know, created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Their sin took them out of the garden, out of fellowship with God, caused death on the earth. God restarted things through Noah when he recreated uh, the world, if you will, or started again with a new human race. And of course, they fell into sin. And so what God did is he started a spiritual race. It was related, connected to a biological family. But these are people that are going to relate to him because they love him and because they want to. In other words, in their microcosm of this small nation... Uh, Jewish nation, the Israelites, they're going to be a microcosm of what Eden was intended to be. People who had a relationship with God. And how this all got started was with one family. God appeared to someone named Abraham. And he said in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to give you, Abraham, three things. I'm going to give you land. We've talked about this before. I'm going to make you a great nation. A great family is going to come for you. And then I'm also going to make you a blessing through your nation, family, to all the world. God re-ups this promise in Genesis chapter 15. A lot that goes on uh, there in Genesis chapter 12 all the way to Genesis chapter 22. But here's the significant thing. They were getting close to 100 years old and didn't have any children. This is Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Now, you would think, this is what Abraham was thinking. If God, if there's a great nation that's going to come for me, we at least have to have one, right? That's That's the starting place. But he had no children. And God promised him, I'm going to give you a son. And through all of that, he just patiently waited on God and patiently waited on God. Not perfectly at all, but patiently. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, patiently waited on God. Now, through all of this that was going on, finally, they had a son. They named the son Isaac, uh, again, very, very much advanced in age. It was this complete miracle. Everybody was shocked that this happened. But now he can see movement. God is finally doing what he believed God was always going to do. And we can just think that Abraham shared the excitement and joy that we would share when we see spiritual progress in our life. Where God is, if you will, being and doing only things that God can do inside of our life. And it was in that, that high moment that God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Now God did not and does not condone human sacrifice. This was, we know from the book of James, a test. God was curious, if you will, if Abraham loved the gift more than the giver. Did he really love this son Isaac and the fulfillment of the promise in his life more than he loved God himself? And if God has ever tested you there, you know um, it's a hard test to pass. And Abraham passed the test because he took his son Isaac to the place of sacrifice, bound him like he was an animal sacrifice, And was about to sacrifice him where an angel of God intervened. And instead of him sacrificing his son, there was a ram caught in the thicket. And that ram that was caught in bushes, he 
came over and he sacrificed that son and released Isaac. And of course, we have to think as New Testament people, that was a picture of Jesus Christ who come and we get out of the way of God's wrath. Jesus absorbs God's wrath and he's there sacrificed for us. And in fact, stay in Genesis 22, we're still about to read it, but this is the book of Hebrews commentary on it. Hebrews 11, 17 says this, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, though Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him up from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And so we only have this commentary here in Isaac, or excuse me, here in Hebrews, that Abraham might have been thinking, look, even if I do kill him, God's going to raise him back to life because I have that much confidence in God's promises. Abraham was completely and totally all in. And so after that incident, here's what happened. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord. That's the important part. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son Isaac, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, as the sand of the sea on its seashore. And so these are the same promises that God gave as an original covenant, but something's changed. God's modifying it. I'm surely going to do this. I'm absolutely going to do this. And the one thing that's here that's different from the original covenant is found in verse 15 where he says, by myself, I have sworn. So go back to Hebrews chapter six. That's what he's referring to when he says in verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Again, It's just a remarkable thought. God had made a promise. God, by definition, is perfect. Therefore, when God speaks, it's always perfect. God doesn't need to promise. He doesn't need to add some layer of assurance to make his word any more real. It it can't be more real. It is what it is. So why did God do this? Well, the issue was not God, of course. The issue was Abraham. God seemed, if I could say it this way, completely committed to Abraham's assurance. He tested him and said, not only have you given my promise, but I'm going to use something else. I'm going to swear. I'm going to make an oath that my promise is absolutely, completely going to come true. And the land that his nation would receive The blessing they would be to all nations, specifically through the person of Jesus Christ, as Paul tells us in Romans. And this huge nation that's come to them all give testimony to the fact here in 2019 that God's oath and his promise were exactly right. That's God's general encouragement for you. God keeps his word. Now, that general encouragement is going to get very, very specific. Look at what happens in verse 16. Here's the specific encouragement. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Now, what does that mean? Well, um, it's it's pretty obvious if two people are entering into a bartering agreement. Imagine this context where you didn't have the legal system that we would have now or arbitration or mediation as we would understand it. If you entered into a covenant with somebody and you really wanted to keep your word, you would say, I swear by the name of God. Or I swear by the temple. In fact, it got so um, really over the top that Jesus said in Matthew 5, look, or Matthew 7, really, you need to cut that out. You're doing that too much. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. But the idea is two people will enter into agreement. They want to make sure they're keeping their word. They don't know if they can trust each other. So they swear by a high authority. Now, God is making a promise with Abraham. What higher authority could God appeal to? There's none, of course. He's God. There's no one higher than God. And so what God does is, Genesis twenty-two sixteen, 16, he swears an oath by himself. And so in verse 16, he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. In the same way that God did this, or same way that we do this, God does this. Verse 17, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Now let's stop here. Here's the really remarkable thing. We said the general encouragement, verses 13 to 15, is that God made a promise to Abraham. Here's the specific encouragement. 
that same promise God makes to you. God has given you his word. God has sealed it with an oath. We are grafted in to the promises that God made if you're a Gentile and we are spiritually recipients of all that God promised to that nation and all that he promised to Abraham. We'll have a land one day in heaven. We get to receive the blessing of Jesus Christ and we're in this great nation of believers, if you will. So there's a continuation there of all the promises that God made to Abraham. So here's the point. The promise God made It's for you. It says it right there. The reason why God did all of this was for the heirs. What's an heir? An heir is someone who receives something they didn't earn. They were giving something by someone else who was greater than them. And so all of this massive human history kind of lands at this point today in June 2019 where God wants you to understand that you can have full confidence and encouragement in him. God has given us his promise. He's given us his oath. You can absolutely trust him. Now, what is the promise about? Well, go back to verse 11, and this clarifies it. Verse 11 says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have full assurance of hope until the end. So the idea is the end, eternal salvation. So it comes off this hard warning in chapter six, verses one through eight, and says, look, I wanna stop here and say something to you. You can have absolute confidence that God is gonna carry you on to the end. This is for you. Look at verse 17. So when God decided to show more convincingly um, what he calls the unchangeable character of his purpose. The idea behind unchangeable is unalterable. It can't be moved. So what God has promised you to have eternal salvation is more real than anything else we've ever known in our lives. Now look at verse 18. So why do you do that? Well, that by two unchangeable things. What are the two unchangeable things? Well, they're first of all, his promise and then his oath. The fact that he said he was gonna do it and the fact that he came on and even made it stronger with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Now, it's very interesting there. He switches metaphors. He was talking about you and I as heirs, recipients of all that God has done for us. When we talk about inheritance in our culture, we think our parents have passed on, they've left us something, or you were in somebody's will and you inherited something that once belonged to them. And the metaphor is a good one, even though it was stronger in their context, because all the promises that God has given, we inherit, and all the blessings that he's promised us, we receive, even though we didn't earn them. We just receive them by virtue of the fact that we're his children. But then, in verse 18... Instead of talking about heirs who receive something, he talks about us as as refugees. Now that's an interesting metaphor. Numbers 35 describes something that God did when uh, they were just about to enter into the promised land and God was establishing the the code by which they would rule the land. He, He came up with a provision for people who specifically had committed a crime, specifically accidentally, like they'd accidentally killed someone. If they accidentally killed someone or they'd killed someone, but their death was in dispute, they could flee to what was called a city of refuge. Now, why would they flee? And I think that given the Hebrew context, there's a hint of that because it doesn't say they, they walked to God's refuge, but fled to God's refuge. Well, you would flee because if you'd killed somebody, even accidentally, the law provided for that person's sibling to be an avenger of blood. In other words, you'd killed somebody, their brother could come and kill you. And so before anybody could figure out what had happened, you would want to flee to get in that city of refuge so that you could be safe while they figured out what happened and before you could plead your case. So in the idea of an heir and the idea of a refugee, you have two really clear aspects of salvation. Salvation is something that God does from beginning to end. We inherit something that we could not receive. When we understand we need salvation, Like a refugee that's away from home, like a refugee that's seeking asylum, we flee and throw ourselves at God's mercy and say, God, would you please accept me into your family? So different aspects of the same thing. However, both someone who is an heir and a refugee have this in common. 
If a refugee is seeking asylum, a home, they can receive it. If someone who's receiving an inheritance gets a home in their will, they can receive it. But both of them are receiving something they did not earn. So in the sense, both metaphors are extremely helpful. Now look at the end of verse 18. So that we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement, watch this, to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Now the word hope is mentioned here in twice, verse 18, verse 19. We already read verse 11, the same idea. We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. It's a very important, um, important part and a theme that's woven through chapter 6. What is the idea of hope? Well, the idea of hope is not how we would understand it and it's not how we would use it. When we use the word hope, we're thinking of something that we think might come true. We say we hope in the sense that we wish for it to be true, but we're not actually confident that this thing is going to happen. It's just a nice wish that we think we would like for it to happen, but we don't know that's what we mean by hope. But hope here is very different. In this biblical sense, hope is used to describe a fixed confidence. It's something that you're absolutely sure will not be moved. Somebody said like this, hope is the feeling you have when you know the feeling you have won't last. That's well said, isn't it? Hope is the feeling you have when you know the feeling you have is not going to last. Uh, love Sunday mornings at 1030. Corporate worship, we get to sing together, we get to worship God together. It takes what oddly at many times is in the background of our life that's really true, the kingdom of God things, and it brings them to the foreground and we can taste and we see and doing it all together as a family makes, gives us a little sense of what heaven's gonna be like. This is very, very real. But while we're worshiping God, I'm aware of his presence. I'm sensitive to the fact that he's here. I'm sensitive to the fact that this is more real than the world that I live in day to day out. But, but here's the reality. I'm also aware of the fact that the feeling that I'm experiencing may not last past lunch. Can you relate to that? Hope is the feeling that you have when you know that the feeling you have is, is not going to last. But my hope is not connected to the fact that I have a sensory uh, perception of what God is doing. Hope is fixed to the reality that God is absolutely unchangeable. And this is why he's saying this now. The reason why God would give a promise and then layer on top of that an oath doesn't have to speak to God's need, but speaks to our need. What's at stake is not that God has to shore up his character, but rather we have to shore up our doubt. God does not need greater accountability, rather we need greater assurance. And so he says, here's a general encouragement. God gave this promise to Abraham. Here's a specific encouragement. Um, this is for you. This is a promise for you. And then he gets to an exact, even more specific encouragement. And it's simply this, that that promise is secured by Jesus himself. Look at verse 19. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what does this mean? We'll go back to verse 19. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Now, an anchor is a, is a physical metaphor for spiritual reality. And he's given lots of metaphors here. He's talked about heirs that receive an inheritance. And we're refugees that are looking for home in Christ. And he talks about the language of arbitration in the courtroom. But here is a very, very provocative metaphor. In fact, if you go to the catacombs in Rome, and this is the place where the early Christians would go and hide from the persecution and where they would worship and fellowship, you'll find anchors that are etched into the walls. There was a very important symbol of the Christian faith, partly because it came back here perhaps to Hebrews chapter 6, where it talks about Jesus being the anchor for the soul. Now, the reason why it's significant is because of what follows it. Look at this. We have the sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the place behind the curtain. Now, what does that mean, into the place behind the curtain? Well, it's clearly, this is talking about the temple. So when you go into the temple, you would have the outer court. People would gather, fellowship, sing, be taught, these type of things. You would have then the inner court where the priest would go. And then you would have the Holy of Holies, the innermost place 
where actually there was the manifest presence of God there above um, the Ark of the Covenant. It was such a sacred place, and this is the important part, significant for this text, that it was inaccessible. No one could go in there. The only person who could go in there would be the priest. He would only go one time of year. The first thing he would do on that day of atonement is he would light some incense to create a literal smoke screen because if he saw the presence of God, he would immediately be killed. You know this, but it was such a frightful thing that when a priest went in there, he would take a rope and he would tie around his ankle and it was his family way of saying, we love you, but if you mess up and see God and you die, we're not coming in after you. We're gonna drag you out and that's gonna be take care of it. They would have bells uh, attached to the edge of the robe so they would know the activity was going on inside of there. They could hear it even if, if they couldn't see the priest because they couldn't go in there. That was a place that was actually hidden behind the veil, if you will. And reason why that's such a great metaphor for this nautical illustration of the anchor is that imagine in that first century, you're out on a boat. And this is a boat that you've made by yourself. There's no GPS. There's no radar. um, There's no radio. There's no way of contacting the shore. um, There's no way to predict the weather. And if you see a storm that comes up or squall that comes up, you, you can actually be done. And they deeply feared what was in the bottom of the ocean because it was the fear of the unknown. They didn't know what kind of monsters lie below the surface down there. They couldn't figure that out. And so going out into a boat and being in a storm was just a scary, scary thing. It was a terrible thing to experience. And so really the only defensive mechanism you had to protect you from that storm was the anchor. And why? Well, your confidence was not just in that anchor, Your confidence was not in the rope that was attached to that anchor. Your confidence is what that anchor was attached to. Because no matter how bad the storm swelled up, if that anchor could lock onto the bottom of the ocean, whatever else would move, you know that the bottom of the ocean is not moving, right? I mean, you have that much confidence. And so when all the swells could come around, when all of this kind of pressed on them, when the squalls rose up, they knew that there was something they couldn't see below the surface that was going to hold them so they could, in the midst of those storms, have complete confidence. So what he's saying is in the same way that an anchor would hold to an invisible place by, beneath the, the ocean where they couldn't see, in the same way our hope actually goes into a hidden place we cannot see, which is in the very holy of holies, the very presence of God. Now here's what makes this metaphor unique. The temple no longer exists. There is no holy of holies, literally. So how can that give us confidence? Well, look at verse 20. A hope that enters into the inner place that's behind the curtain. Now verse 20, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we understand what's going on. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50 says that when Jesus said it is finished, the veil of the temple that was separating the people from the Holy of Holies was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Jesus saying now God is still there. He's still resting there. But my death and resurrection is giving you access into a place where you haven't been before. So if there is a holy place now, it's not here on earth. It's in heaven where God's throne is. Well, that makes sense because Romans chapter 8 tells us that Jesus Christ lives to make intercession for us is at the right hand of his father at the throne, which means my hope is not in myself. My hope is not in my ability to stay on. My hope is not in my ability to press on. My hope is in the fact that Jesus Christ has anchored my soul to the very throne room of God. And I am as capable of losing my salvation as the throne room of God is of moving. God's not going anywhere. Jesus will always there be permanently, this is the point, forever a priest, permanently securing myself there. And so this promise is for you. You're secure. Are you in Christ? Then you're secure. And those of you that doubt and the squalls of insecurity circle around you. This is the writer's way of saying, look, I, I want to give you a general encouragement. God made a double promise to Abraham. And let me give you a specific encouragement. That double promise was for you. And now let me give you something even more exact and precise and phenomenally encouraging. That double promise secures your hope to the very throne of God where Jesus forever and never leaves, forever stands there to secure it. What a... What a phenomenal God we serve, don't we? 
who would, who would do that for us, who would secure that salvation for us. I was thinking about all the insecurity in the world that there is. There's a lot of it. Um, we're in the strangest natural disaster I've ever seen here in Arkansas. Where someone said whose house is threatened, it's the strangest thing. I know it's happening, it's terrible, but we've known it for weeks, but it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. Never thought this was happening. I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, I was moving to Arkansas. They're moving to Arkansas. I thought I was moving into the mountains. Do you think I need flood insurance? I, I wouldn't talk you out of it if you wanted to buy that right now. So much is uncertain. Listen, this isn't. God is on his throne. Jesus is at his right hand. And because of that, we are secure. I was thinking about that marathon Imagine a little girl, six, seven, eight, nine years old, running across the finish line with her daddy. She's gone a few hundred yards, maybe. He's gone 26 miles. Um, but she gets that finisher medal at the end. And clearly, for my engagement with her, she's confident she did it. I run marathons. I did that. Now, she has no idea and can't at that stage of life what it takes to run a marathon. How in the world uh, could she conceive of the hours and hours it would take? Um, the, the, the dietary issues you would have to consider. Uh, all the training that would take place. The tenacity and the willpower and the time and sacrifice. She doesn't yet have the equipment mentally to understand the sacrifice that that would take. But it doesn't matter. Because she's not there actually celebrating her victory. She's there celebrating her daddy's victory. Maybe you've wondered... How could God love me with all that I've done? How could God conceive of me as his child? And I say to you by way of encouragement, pressing this metaphor of verses 19 and 20, so much of that is behind the veil. My confidence is not in myself. My confidence is in his stride. My confidence is in his pace. My confidence is in his endurance. My confidence is in his tenacity. My confidence in his ability to go over the finish line. And when I reach the finish line, I'll go over the finish line. Not because I did, but because he did before me. He's the, he's the forerunner. He's the forerunner. And all that we have in life, we have in Christ. And for that, we praise him. Father God, we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would bring us to a moment, to a place of decision. Thinking through all that you've done for us and responding. There's some here that have, have given your heart and life to Christ. You know who you are, but the truth is you've never You've never genuinely come into a place where you've put all your confidence and hope in him in a way that suggests you're secure. There's no doubt. If that's the case, you're a believer. This is, this is your moment to respond to him. There are others that have never given your life to Christ. And you've never taken seriously what Jesus said to repent and to follow him. And for you, this morning is about turning your back on your sin and turning toward Christ and following him. It doesn't imply perfection. What it implies is will. You're willfully leaving who you were and you're willfully following Christ. For some, this is your moment. It's it. It's right now. This is your moment. And if that's the case, you need to tell God that right now. Just say, God, forgive me my sin. Come into my life. Tell him you want to give your life to him. Believe that he died and rose again and now with that prayer have confidence that he hears you, that he responds. Others need to join this church. If that's the case, we'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a member of this church. We'll, our pastors are going to be lined up here in the front. So you come down the center aisle, these side aisles, talk to them about what it means to follow Christ, be a believer, what it means to join this church. Or maybe you just want to make this altar, your altar of prayer. We want to have a culture inside of our church that says this is our time. It's our moment to kneel, to respond, to pray in whatever way that God is leading you. In whatever way he's calling you to come, you just step out and you just come. Father God, we're grateful for your love for us. God, we pray our response would mirror all that you've done for us. We pray it in Jesus' name.
if you go ahead and stand with us, we're going to worship the Father together this morning. We'll sing us out at your heart. It's your heart we're searching for. We want you and nothing more. Let your glory. recognize that you are on your throne even now you're listening to your people praise you even now we're going to sing a new song called unstoppable god so no matter what season of life we're going through we know that god's plans and his rule cannot be thwarted so let's sing about that church this morning sing heaven thundered heaven thundered and the world was born and life begins and ends in the Oh, oh, oh. 
Nothing shall be impossible with our God. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. In Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, and keep singing that. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Thank you for joining us today on the broadcast of Emmanuel Baptist Church. We're so glad that you came. We at Emmanuel have had a long, rich history of a pulpit that honors the Word of God. And what we mean by that is that when we open the Word of God, we try to present it in a text-driven way. 
representing the substance of the word of God, but also representing its structure and its spirit as well, reflecting a high view of scripture. So glad that you came to join us today. Hope to see you each week at this time.